Good morning, and welcome to this gathering of City Light Church. As we prepare to worship the Lord together this morning, let's stand and let's say these words together from Psalm 18. 118. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing and rejoice um, to our great God together this morning. Oh 
continue and sing. We just sang songs of praise and worship to God, rejoicing in his goodness and mercy. But it is also good to come humbly and confess our sins and the ways that we have turned from him. It is good to acknowledge the ways that we find contentment and rest in something other than Jesus. As God's children, we know God is the giver of good gifts. What would God ever withhold from us? if he was willing to give his only son for us. In verse three and four of Psalm 24, it says this, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands 
and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Let's respond to God and confess our sin of discontentment together with one voice. The words of this confession will be on the screen behind me. Let's say this. Generous God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we are grateful that you faithfully provide for our needs. We constantly desire more. We quickly become dissatisfied and we easily envy what others have. Forgive us of our greed, cure us of our idolatry, and teach us contentment. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Hear the good news from the book of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Amen.
Amen. Because Jesus is our Savior, we always have a reason to praise and rejoice because there's always something in the Lord worth rejoicing in. You may be seated. Well, I want to wish all of you a happy Father's Day. You know, uh, dads, given the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ's favorite name for God is Father, it is quite the privilege for any of us to be called dad and to be an earthly father. And dads, in a world that so often marginalizes uh, masculine strength, uh, we want you to know that God sees you, that God loves you, and we honor you for the way that you humbly follow the Savior for the ways that you selflessly love your wives and children, and for all the ways that you sacrificially serve as spiritual fathers here at City Light Church. And so, dads, this morning, I want to honor you in the best way that I know how, which is to pray for you. And I want to pray for you a prayer adapted uh, from a pastor named Bob Coughlin. Let's join our hearts in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven... On this day, when fathers are being remembered and honored throughout the world, we first honor you. Because you are the father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. And Father, your word says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Father, your word says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are amazing. And Father, we acknowledge this morning that apart from Jesus Christ, we could only fall back in fear at the thought of approaching you, a God so holy, so righteous, so just. But your word says that we do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry to you, Abba, Father. Because the sinless Savior died, our sinful souls are counted free. Our debt has been paid, and we are no longer your enemies, but your dearly loved adopted children through Christ alone. And Father, my prayer is that you will enable all of those who have trusted in the atoning death and bodily resurrection of Jesus, who are gathered this morning, I pray that you will grant them to experience you as their heavenly father. 
And Father, we also thank you for the fathers among us, for the soon-to-be fathers, for the young fathers, the middle-aged fathers, old fathers, grandfathers. Thank you for their sacrifices and their desire to reflect your heart to their children. We praise you for the City Light Church dads who selflessly and, of course, imperfectly represent you to their children. They are a gift from you. We praise you for them. And Father, my prayer for every dad in this room is that you will make them aware of the privilege and the gift and the responsibility of fatherhood. Please cause them to not provoke their children to anger, but to delight in their children, teach them your wisdom and godliness, and discipline their children with the great love of consistency. Fill those of us who are weary as fathers with fresh strength for the task. Pray that we would know your spirit's power in our weakness. And Heavenly Father, we also thank you for our fathers, whom you specifically chose for us, whether by natural birth or adoption. Thank you for those who had good fathers. Thank you for their example, their care, their counsel, their presence in our lives. We honor them appropriately through our words and our deeds. And Father, for those who don't have good memories of their fathers, we pray that they would be strengthened with power through your spirit in their inner being so that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith, that they would know, as Paul prays, the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And we pray for those who do not have good memories for their fa- of their fathers, for patience to understand, mercy to forgive, and courage to stand fast in the truth of the gospel. For those fathers who are estranged from a child or children, or anyone who is unreconciled with their own father, would you bring to pass the promise of Malachi 4.6, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. For those who have never known their dads, I pray that today they will be more aware than ever that you are the father of the fatherless and that nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. For those who long to be fathers but have yet to be granted that gift, comfort them with the comfort that comes from your endless supply of mercy and care and grant to them to the desires of their hearts, we pray. And finally, Jesus, thank you that you assured us of our heavenly father's care when you said, look at the birds of the air, They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, Well, Walter's gonna come up and share some announcements with us this morning. Will you guys give a hearty good morning to Walter? Good morning, City Light. Ch- Good morning, and welcome to this gathering of City Light Church. My name is Walter. I'm the Connections Director here at City Light. And if this is your first time here, I'd like to take a minute and tell you what our church is all about. City Light Church exists to make disciples of Jesus to the glory of God. And we do that through worship, community, and mission that is all done in response to the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done for us. And I'd love to help you find a home here at City Light. And so to help you find a home here at City Light, would you please grab this orange and white connect card that was on your seat when you walked in? If you fill out your name and email on this card, I will send you an email tomorrow morning to give you some more information about the church and how you can find your home here at City Light. Filling out a connect card is also how you get added to our weekly email list where you'll learn about the future events of City Light Church, including our summer picnic, which is gonna be happening on July 9th after the second service. More information about that will be coming your way, but for now, please save the date. And even if you're a regular, would you please hold on to this Connect card over the next few minutes while we go through our announcements this morning. First, a celebration of those who have come from death to new life in Christ. I'm excited to announce that next week, June 25th, after the second service. Lord willing, if the weather is nice, we'll be having this in the amphitheater outside, and that is our next baptism service. Baptisms are a great opportunity for you to witness and be encouraged by the testimonies of those who have come from death to new life in Christ. And it's gonna be happening next week outside at 1230 or after the second service. And if you haven't been baptized since becoming a follower of Christ, I would encourage you, go ahead and check that baptism box on your Connect card, and we'll get you some more information about what it might look like for you to get baptized here at City Light. Next, 
If you consider City Light to be your home church, I would love to encourage you to give regularly, sacrificially, and joyfully to the mission of City Light Church to make disciples of Jesus to the glory of God. City Light is in the middle of a two-year generosity initiative called REACH, and that means that every gift that is given to City Light in the next two years goes toward continuing our day-to-day -day mission of making disciples, which is why we exist, and toward securing a long-term home for our church here in Northwest Philly. And you can give either in the orange box in the back where you'll put your connect card, or by any of the options on the screen behind me. And finally, one of the most exciting things that our church has got going on this summer is we are doing our first ever VBS. Woo! Woo! It's been 11 years, it's about time, and we are so excited to be able to reach out to the community in this way. VBS is not just something for our kids and families, it's something that we're doing as a whole church. It's gonna be held in the evenings of August 7th through the 11th, from 5.30 to 8, with an optional dinner at 5 p.m. for any families who would benefit from that. It's open to kids ages three all the way up to fourth grade. And like I mentioned, this is an exciting opportunity, not just for our kids and families, but for everyone. It's an opportunity to engage our neighbors in the Maniunk Roxborough area who otherwise would never be engaged with our ministry. And to share just one example of this, I would like to invite up uh, Covenant member Dan Buckley to share the story about how VBS worked not only in his life, but in the lives of his family as well. So would you please give Dan a warm welcome? Thanks, Walter. Hey, everyone. My name is Dan, like Walter said, and I'm a Covenant member here at City Light, along with my wife. And I am so excited to be able to do VBS with you this year. You know, VBS was the first time that I ever heard the gospel. When I was young, I, we didn't talk about Jesus much. <laughs> My parents would probably agree that at the time they didn't have the strongest of faith. You know, we didn't go to church. They grew up in the church, and their faith had since waned. I couldn't tell you who Jesus was, even in the abstract. I couldn't tell you about Noah or Adam and Eve or any of the classic Bible stories. My parents' faith just wasn't that strong when I was young. And then when I was in middle school, we went to a VBS. And I wish I could tell you all of the amazing things that we did at the VBS, but I can't because I was in middle school. That was a while ago. I can't tell you the theme or the things that we did. I can't tell you the stories or the lessons that we learned. Honestly, apart from a couple of songs that refused to get out of my head so many years later, I can't tell you much at all. My mom, on the other hand, had a very different memory, a very different experience. So VBS at that time would start with songs and some body movements. So the church that I was going to for this VBS took hand motions to the extreme, and by the time you were done, you felt like you had your workout for the week done. So we'd do those body motions. We would split up and have games and crafts and all of the VBS activities. And then on the final day, we would go through every evening of the week, just like we are going to. And on the final day, all of the parents were invited. And the kids would all perform. We would perform the songs that we learned throughout the week or the stories that we learned and share what we had with our parents. And it was on that final night as we, the kids, were singing about Jesus and about the things that we learned, that my mom, with tears in her eyes, was watching her kids worship Jesus and said, I want that for my family. That was the beginning of her rekindling of her faith. And it would be more than eight years until I gave my life to Christ, but that was the start of my journey to meet him too. And now my mom still goes to that church. She volunteers at VBS every year. My siblings all grew up going to that VBS. My, my sister, who's now in college, even skipped vacation with her friends to go and lead those VBS song workouts. <laughs> and it really was the beginning of rekindling for my family. And now this year, my son gets to come for the first time to a VBS. I pray that someone that you invite this year to VBS will have that experience that not just the kids that you bring, but the whole families will be impacted for generations to come. 
and hear the gospel, especially for those families that may have never stepped into our church and hear the gospel on a Sunday morning, can come those evenings during VBS. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Well, if you would like to sign your children up for VBS or you would like to volunteer to be part of the team that makes VBS possible, you can just let us know on your Connect card. You can write VBS and the names of your children or you can just write VBS volunteer and you can be uh, part of that. What an amazing story we believe the Lord is going to weave uh, through VBS uh, this year. And if you need just one more reason to attend next Sunday's baptism services, because I want to encourage you, even if you're not getting baptized, this is such a rich time to be encouraged in your faith. If you need just one more reason, my main man, Soren, is getting baptized uh, next Sunday. And Pastor Tim's daughter, Felicity, is getting baptized next Sunday. And so this is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate a uh, new life in Christ next Sunday after uh, the 11 a.m. service. So uh, with that said, we're going to turn our attention now to God's Word. And this morning, we're continuing our sermon series, Better Than We Think. Now, if you're somewhat new to City Light Church, you should know that typically on Sunday mornings, we work our way through books of the Bible. And so as soon as this series is over, we're going to be into the Psalms, as we often are in the summer. And then in the fall, we'll kick off our series in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Uh, But during these six weeks, we're doing something a little different. We are focusing in on six, what you might call bumper sticker verses. Uh, Six of the best known, uh, most popular verses in the Bible, the verses that you are most likely, if you're going to see a Bible verse on a bumper sticker, these are going to be them. And we're slowing down to take a close look, and as we do, we're discovering that these verses, they're even better than we think. And so this morning, we're continuing with perhaps the favorite verse in all the Bible among professional athletes, and that is Philippians 4, verse 13. And so if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Philippians 4.13. If you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab the one underneath your seat. Philippians 4.13 is on page 923 in the Bibles under your chairs. I always want to encourage you when we gather on the Lord's Day to look to God's Word that you follow along in your own Bible. And I say that because the authority in our church doesn't lie with me or the other pastors. Uh, Rather, it's with God and His Word. So I always want you to follow along with us. And would you stand, please, to honor the reading of this one verse from God's word. This is the Apostle Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God's inerrant word. And he writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, as we come to the Bible now, this book that followers of Jesus believe you have written, we pray that you will speak to us. Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit, who inspired every word of Scripture, will also illuminate your word to our hearts this morning so that all of us can both understand it and be transformed by it. And we pray that you won't only speak to us as individuals this morning, but speak to us as a church family, we pray, Father, so that together we will be changed into the likeness of Jesus, so that we can be a light to the world and a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. And Father, I pray for myself that you will preach through me a better sermon than I've prepared. I pray now that my words will fall to the floor and your word alone will go forth into our hearts. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I wanna talk to you this morning about contentment. About contentment. And I wanna talk to you about contentment because discontentment is at the root of most of our sinful actions and negative emotions. Discontentment is actually as old as Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. Our first parents were discontent. They would not be satisfied with the life that God had given them with him in the Garden Paradise. Their hearts ached for what they could not have, the fruit that God had forbidden. 
And in their discontentment, they were willing to rebel against and be done with God in order to have what they did not. And the cosmos has literally never been the same since. And so I want to talk to you about contentment this morning because discontentment is at the heart of most of our sinful actions and negative emotions. And yet, Christian contentment is both a rare jewel and the privilege of every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to talk to you about contentment this morning because contentment is what Philippians 4.13 is actually all about. Now, of course, if we see Philippians 4.13 on sort of a bumper sticker on the back of a car or tattooed on our favorite athlete's chest, you know, we're, we might just naturally conclude that Philippians 4.13 is all about being able to hit home runs and score touchdowns and land promotions and achieve goals and overcome all obstacles through Christ who strengthens us. We might think that. But Philippians 4.13 is actually better than that. It's actually better than we think. And we see that Philippians 4.13 is better than we think by looking at it in its context. So let's begin by doing that together. We'll begin in Philippians 4 verse 10. You'll see the words on the screen behind me. Paul's writing somewhat autobiographically and he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now, when Paul uses this word concern, he's actually referring to financial partnership in the gospel. You see, the Philippian church was one of the very first churches to support Paul's gospel preaching and church planting ministry. And somewhat right before Paul writes this letter, they had revived their concern for him, meaning they had begun to financially support his ministry again. And Paul's just rejoicing in the Lord over that, but Paul does not want the Philippian church to get it twisted. He doesn't want them to think that he was discontent when they couldn't partner with him financially. Verse 11, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. In other words, Paul may have had financial need, but he didn't have any true need because he had learned in whatever situation to be content, even situations like having grave financial need. And then in verse 12, Paul expands on this idea that he learned in whatever situation to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance, and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So Philippians 4.13 is actually better than we think because Paul learned to experience all things, whether plenty, hunger, abundance, need. He learned the secret to experiencing all things with contentment. And this isn't just a rare jewel for Paul. This is the privilege of every follower of Christ. And that brings us to the big idea of Philippians 4.13. We can always be content through Christ. The big idea of Philippians 4.13 is we can always be content through Christ. As Paul says, he had learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He can do all things, experience all things, all circumstances with contentment through Christ who gives him strength. That's our privilege as well. Now, this big idea raises, I think, two big questions that we're going to tackle together this morning. We can always be content through Christ. Question one, what is contentment? What is true Christian contentment? Question two, what is the secret? Paul said he had learned the secret, facing all things with contentment. What's the secret? We can always be content through Christ. What is contentment? What is the secret? Now, uh, before we get into these two questions, I want to say just two quick personal things. Uh, First, nearly everything that I have learned 
about what the Bible teaches regarding contentment. Uh, I have either learned or have been highly influenced by uh, this. This is one of my top three favorite books of all time. It's entitled The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment written by a Puritan pastor named Jeremiah Burroughs. I believe it was published in year 1657. It is fabulous. Pretty much everything I'm going to say this morning is either from this book or influenced by it. I want you to know that up front so I just don't have to say Jeremiah Burroughs' name like every two seconds throughout the sermon. Second thing I want to say. This sermon is very personal to me. I have struggled perhaps with the sin of discontentment more than any other in my Christian life, and I still struggle with it deeply to this day. And in God's good providence, he's brought our family into, I think, a uniquely challenging season, and we have this opportunity as a family to learn contentment through Christ again together. And so I just want you to know, this morning, I'm not so much like preaching to you as I am talking to us. Uh, So with that said, let's begin with the first question. What is contentment? We'll start with Jeremiah Burroughs' definition because it's the best one I've ever read. It's a little long, and we'll take it bit by bit. He writes, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. Let me translate a little bit of that old English. Burroughs writes, Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious, sort of a a kind, gracious, quiet, inward heart. Uh, Christian contentment could be described as having a quiet heart. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit. Gracious frame of spirit just means like attitude, inward attitude. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious attitude which freely submits to. So it's not forced to submit. It freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal. So instead of disposal, think God's wise and fatherly disposal. Providence, God's wise and fatherly will for every moment of your life in every condition. Okay, so we're going to leave this definition on the screen for a bit, and we're going to take it piece by piece so that we can learn what Christian contentment is. And the first thing that we learn from the definition is that Christian contentment is an inward thing. Okay, it's, a, it's an inward thing. You know, some people, just by sheer personality, Uh, tend to be sort of naturally calm and quiet outwardly. That's not what Christian contentment is. Uh, Christian contentment is not being outwardly quiet while there's a storm of chaos going on inside your heart, but you're just able to kind of control yourself enough to be quiet on the outside. That's not Christian contentment. Okay, so like for example, uh, this weekend, uh, Andrea, Soren, and I went golfing together. It's fantastic. We decided we're going to get the golf cart. You know, just like move this experience on a little bit. And so we get in the golf cart, and I couldn't figure out how to work it. And, and like, there's other dudes standing around, and I'm feeling like very ashamed, uh, t- just like shame and insecurity, and I can't get this thing to work. And my own son is watching this whole thing happening, who I want to admire me. And even if I had kept myself completely quiet outwardly, which I didn't, even if I kept myself completely quiet outwardly, all that chaos going on on the inside is discontentment, no matter what it looks like on the outside. Because Christian contentment is first an inward thing. It's a heart thing. The second thing that we learn is that Christian contentment is a sweet, quiet, gracious attitude. It's a quiet attitude. Sort of like Psalm 131 says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I've calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. So Christian contentment is an inward thing, and it's an inward quiet. It's having a quiet heart. Here's a quote from Jeremiah Burroughs. It says, Now I say, 
that contentment is a quiet frame of spirit. And by that, I mean that you should find men and women, he's, he's speaking of Christian men and women, in a good mood. Not only at this or that time, but as the constant tenor and temper of their hearts. So Christian contentment is an inward, quiet, good mood. Because Jesus is risen and he's with us always, we should be fundamentally a people that you'll find in a good mood, not constantly irritable. The third thing we learn is that contentment is an attitude. So it's, it's this inward, quiet attitude. But notice from the definition, if you put the definition back on the screen, notice from the definition that it says it's the result of freely submitting to and delighting in God's will in every situation. Okay, in other words, and this, this is so important, the inward quiet and peace, that good mood, that sort of like non-complaining, non-murmuring content heart, it's actually the result of learning to submit to and delight in God's will in all your situations. So let's start with submitting to. Christian contentment is the result of learning to get your will under God's will. Christian contentment is learning to make whatever God's will is for your situation, your will. Because his ways are better than your ways. His thoughts are better than your thoughts. He is God, we are not. He is sovereign, we are not. And so Christian contentment is learning to get our will under God's will. Okay, so, um, for example, on, on Friday, Andrea and I, we just had this wonderful privilege of getting to go uh, first out to lunch with, with a, a couple that we just, we love dearly. And they have a son that's Soren's age. We got to go out to lunch. It's awesome. And then on Saturday evening, we got to go to uh, another family's home for dinner. It was like an absolutely wonderful time. Now, what I didn't tell you is the couple that we have lun had lunch with used to be members of City Light Church, but now they've moved and live in a different city. And then the couple that we had dinner with will soon move to live in a different city. And the, that sort of transient experience of relationships is not what Andrea and I would typically choose for our life. We don't like it. We don't like watching people that we love move away to new places, but Christian contentment comes when instead of rising up over God's will and trying to give him a theology lesson about how he ought to run the universe and run my life, instead of saying, I'm gonna get under your will. We're not gonna rise up with a bad attitude and opposition against you. This is your choice. This is your doing. You've chosen to move these dear friends to a new place and who are we to dispute your will? We're gonna get under that. But Christian contentment is more than submitting to God. It's actually learning to delight in his ways because we trust that his ways are wiser than our ways. And that brings me to um, a quote from Jeremiah Burroughs that really means the world to me. So remember, Christian contentment, it's an inward thing and it's an inward thing that is quiet. It's a quiet heart. It's a quiet heart that comes from submitting to God's will rather than rising up against it and sort of murmuring and complaining either in your heart or with your words. But then it goes a step further. It's actually delighting in what God chooses for your life, even if it's not at all what you would choose. Burroughs writes, to be well pleased with God's hand is a higher degree than the previous one. So he's saying delighting in God's will is actually a higher degree than just submitting to it. It comes from this. Not only do I see that I should be content in this affliction, but I see that there is good in it. I find there is honey in this rock. And so I don't only say, I must or I will submit to God's hand. No, the hand of God is good, Psalm 119. It is good that I'm afflicted. In his submission, that is in a Christian submission, he sees his, that is God's sovereignty. What Bros is saying is, if you're gonna submit to God's will and everything, you just have to know he's sovereign and you're not. But you need something else if you're actually gonna delight in God. If you're gonna to submit to God in every situation, not rise up against him, you just have to see you're sovereign, I'm not, okay? But if you're gonna delight in it, you need something else. Notice this, he says, 
he sees his sovereignty, but what makes him take pleasure is God's wisdom. The Lord knows how to order things better than I. The Lord sees further than I do. I only see things at present, but the Lord sees a great while from now. And how do I know? But had it not been for this affliction, I should have been undone. In other words, to submit to God and to make your will his will, you have to know that God's sovereign. But if you're going to delight in it, then you have to know this isn't going the way I want. But what God wants is far wiser than what I want because he sees further and he knows better. So, for example, most of my, like, adult life, I have struggled with the sort of pull and even the temptation of uh, depression. Sort of that, that pull of darts. It's a greater, lesser degree at different times. And if you've ever struggled with the pull of depression and some of the obsessiveness that goes with it, you've probably had the experience where you've thought, um, I, I would gladly take anything but this. Like there's just sort of nothing worse than a melancholy soul. And I've just wanted like, oh, I just wish I didn't experience this affliction. Any other affliction, please? But how do I know that if I didn't experience this weakness that I would know the strength of Christ as I've experienced it. I mean, to be totally frank with you, if it hadn't been for this pull of depression, like, I probably would be far harsher with people than I even am now. <laughs> I actually didn't mean that as a joke. Um, <laughs> and, and to be honest, also, like, I've thought, if it wasn't for this struggle with a melancholy soul, um, probably the outward success of City Light Church and the churches we've planted would have filled me with a ton of pride by now. And so I delight, I boast in the weakness of depression because when I'm weak, the strength of Christ is perfected. And if it hadn't been for this, God only knows what kind of monster I might have become. So what do we see? We see that Christian contentment, it's an inward thing. It's a heart attitude, not a result of circumstances. It submits to and delights in God's fatherly disposal. And do you notice next we see, and finally, um, that it's for every condition. And every one of us thinks our present condition is the exception. But it's for every condition. To be honest, I think that most of us can recognize that sometimes having an abundance is actually the hardest time to be content. You know, C.S. Lewis used to say that God whispers to us through the good times, but our pain is his megaphone. It can be harder to hear God's voice, harder to have this sense of urgency of dependence upon Christ when all is well. But Paul says he's learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And in part, the secret is the fatherhood of God. As Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be your name. When we bless God in every circumstance, then when circumstances are great, we can actually be content in them. Rather than thinking this ought to be the case all the time. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you go out for like a great meal so, like a wonderful time, good people, really good food, and your heart starts to go, I wish I had this every day. Like if you're me, it's like, I should have steak every day. I'm, you know, I'm entitled to this. That's the discontentment of the good times. And it's a result of not tracing the, uh, the gift to the giver. And in the hard times, the reason why we grow discontent is because we tend to experience our hard times in isolation from Christ himself. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. And this is your privilege as a follower of Christ. Now, before we tackle the second question, and the second question we'll tackle far more briefly. I want to say just a quick word about what contentment is not opposed to. Because you've heard me talk a bit about what contentment is biblically. What is contentment not opposed to? A few things. First, Christian contentment is not opposed to feeling afflicted. You know, sometimes we get the idea, oh no, I feel afflicted. I must not be content. No. Christian, the whole point of Christian contentment is that you're able to be quiet in your heart with the Lord while feeling afflicted. So Christian contentment is not opposed to feeling afflicted. Second, Christian contentment is not opposed 
to reasonably complaining to God and our friends. Christian contentment is not opposed to crying out to God to both give you comfort in the midst of the affliction and to change the affliction. Christian contentment is not opposed to complaining to your friends for the sake of asking them to give you an encouraging word in season. Now, we need to parse this a little bit. Remember, venting will never help you. Have you ever noticed that? I'm going to vent and you always feel worse. Getting something off your chest is not the same as telling someone about the affliction that you have so that they can give you a word in season to encourage you. And then finally, Christian contentment is not opposed to using biblical means to, li- to be delivered from present afflictions. So Christian contentment is not opposed to feeling afflicted. It's not opposed to making a reasonable complaint to God and your friends, and it's not opposed to using biblical means to be delivered from present afflictions. You can be quiet under God's trials and also cry out to God to change your trials and afflictions. If singleness is a trial for you, it is no sign of discontentment to ask a godly woman on a date and pray to God that she'll say yes. And more of you young men should do such things. If infertility is a trial, it is no sign of discontentment to consult a fertility doctor. Discontentment is when your heart rises above God and says, no, I will not endure this. In fact, I'm going to sin and weasel my way on out of it with compromise. Christian contentment is I will seek all of God's fatherly means of relief from this without breaking his law. So Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. And the big idea of Philippians 4.13 is we can always be content through Christ can always be content through Christ. And so that brings us finally and briefly to our second question. What is the secret? Paul said he had learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. He can face everything with contentment through Christ who strengthens him. So what's the secret? I actually think we learned the secret. Uh, Pastor Mark pointed this out to me this week by flipping one chapter back to Philippians 3. I'm going to put the words on the screen behind me. This is Philippians 3 verses 4 to 8 where we learn the secret of Christian contentment. This is Paul writing again somewhat autobiographically and he says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. I know most of you, that's not like a matter of boasting for you, but Paul is talking about his Jewish pedigree, which was previously his whole identity. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now, here's the secret to contentment. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, all things, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You notice that Paul's not just talking about his Jewish pedigree in verse 8. He says, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. The secret of contentment is Christ. The secret of contentment in all circumstances is treasuring Christ. Christ himself is the secret. We can face plenty and hunger, abundance and need because we have Christ in the midst of our plenty and our hunger and our abundance and our need. When we have Christ, when we know him and we lean on him and we depend on him and we treasure him, then this world becomes dim. And if we have nothing, we have him. Christ himself is the secret of contentment. Because with Christ, think of it this way, with Christ, you have the ultimate friend, no matter what you're facing. Yeah, my, my best friend in all the world, aside from my wife, Andrea, is my best friend, uh, Jeremy Hart. Jeremy and I talk on the phone at 6 a.m. every other Thursday morning, and it is a lifeline. I can face so much with so much more contentment because of this friendship. 
because he's there to listen to me. He's there to give me wise advice, to correct my crazy, and to encourage me in Christ all along the way. And friends, Jesus Christ made Jeremy Hart. He is the ultimate friend who is always with you. He always knows what's really going on. And his wisdom is perfect and his power is complete. He is the fr- Jesus is the friend who as you interact with him more and more, he will strengthen you to have just enough to rejoice in the Lord today. And there will be new morning mercies tomorrow. Christ is the friend who sticks closer than a brother who slowly but surely over time strengthens you into the person who can rejoice in the Lord today and leave tomorrow to tomorrow. But not only is Christ the ultimate friend, Christ also makes this world rubbish. So much of the discontentment we face is the result of not having what we demand. Desires are fine, but James chapter four says that most of the fights, quarrels that go on outwardly and frankly inwardly in our hearts are the result of our desires becoming over-desires, our desires becoming demands. But Christ, when you have Christ, the secret of contentment, the one who sticks closer than a brother, who forgives all your sins and is with you always and helps you as you face everything. When you have Christ, the things of this world become strangely dim and you can desire them, but when you don't have them, they don't become demands. I don't know what it is that you desire right now above all else, but if it is not Christ, it will let you down and it can't give you an identity, and it can't secure your future. Christ himself is the secret of contentment because he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother, and through him, you are crucified to this world and this world to you. And so if you don't have the career you want, the body you want, the marriage you want, the husband you want, the wife you want, the children you want, the vacation you want, you have Christ. And he is such a treasure that all others become strangely dim. And you may desire them, but they are not your demand. And so you can have a quiet heart. And Christ himself is the secret of contentment because Christ makes God your father. Through the sinless life, the atoning death, and the victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, through faith in him alone, we become the adopted children of God. We were once enemies of God, but by the grace that is in Christ, through his blood and righteousness, we're adopted as his sons and daughters, and that means that we can relate to God as our father. The secret to contentment is through Christ experiencing the fatherhood of God and your own sonship in him. And we learn from Christ how to relate to God as our father, in the midst of our afflictions. Do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane? You remember what Jesus did in the midst of his affliction? He cried out, Father, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Some of us really need to start praying that prayer. You're in the midst of afflictions, you're in the midst of hardship, and you think you're just too godly to cry out for help. Well, then you you apparently think you are more godly than Christ because he cried out, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He asked boldly, but notice he also surrendered completely. Christian contentment is asking boldly and then surrendering completely. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Christ himself as your true treasure is the secret of contentment because with him, in communion with him, talking with him, leaning on him, you can face plenty and hunger, abundance and need and you can do it all with contentment, with a quiet heart because you have Christ who's always strengthening you. So Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to, oh friend, please never think disobeying God is going to get you out of your discontent situation. You're only gonna trouble your troubles.
Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. And the secret to it is Christ, who alone can make God your father and be your treasure in all seasons and circumstances. And Christ will be your treasure forever. See, because of the finished work of Christ, we will one day be done with this world of sin and sorrow. One day, the pull of the darkness of this world and the discontentment of our heart will be gone in the twinkling of an eye. And all who have, been trust, have trusted in Christ will come home with him to a new heaven and a new earth and every tear will be wiped away and sin will be no more and he will make all things new forever. And we can be content now because that is our sure and unshakable future in Christ. May God give us the grace to be a city on a hill and a light to the world in our furious age because we have Christian contentment through Christ. That sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's fatherly disposal in every situation. We can say with Paul, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our greatest treasure. And we ask that you would help us to treasure you more and more. May we be able to say with Paul, God forbid that I should boast in anything but the cross of Christ, through which I have been crucified to the world and the world to me. Jesus, crucify us to this world. Help us to be dead to this world and alive to you with quiet hearts that are content because you've taught us that our Father in heaven is wise and good in every situation. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna prepare our hearts now to participate in the Lord's Supper or communion. The communion elements are gonna begin to pass now. This is a meal that we take as a family together. As they begin to pass, I want you to begin to prepare your hearts for communion. I'll have some further instructions on how to do that in a moment, but for now, if the communion elements aren't passing by you, let's take a moment or two right where you are to begin to pray, to prepare your hearts to be refreshed in treasuring Christ together. Just begin to quiet your heart before the Lord. The Lord's Supper is the meal by which we remember that we are forgiven and free and assured of a truly content future through Jesus' shed blood and his righteousness. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, during this time of reflection is a time to turn from your sin and trust in Christ, the only one who can secure for you a future that is not eternal judgment, but eternal life. And as followers of Jesus, this is a time to prepare your hearts to remember again the source of true contentment, Christ himself. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, feel free to just let the communion elements pass. This is a time for you to pray, to ask Jesus to reveal himself to you as Savior. Now that the elements are mostly passed out, if you're a follower of Christ during this time, just it's a time to confess your sins before the Lord and to rejoice again that Christ's finished work is what makes us whole. Forgiven, adopted, 
insecure forever. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, there's a sample prayer at the bottom of your Connect card that can help give you language for turning from your sin and trusting Jesus as your only hope in life and in death. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. Let's take uh, the bread element. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat in remembrance of his body broken to make us the adopted children of God. Paul goes on, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, so you can grab the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Through Jesus' blood we have a whole new relationship with God. We are adopted as his children. He is our father. Let's drink in remembrance. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand together to worship the one who has given us this rare jewel of contentment. If there's anything you would like prayer for, please head to the back. There'll be folks under the prayer signs. They'd love to pray with you. Over the past uh, few years, um, I've struggled with some health issues and um, it's kept me from doing a lot of the things I want to do. Um, but this past week, the Lord it came up again. I had been experiencing some rest and reprieve, and it, those health issues came up again. And the Lord brought a sister in my life who sent this verse to me. But as for me, I will sing of your mighty strength and power. Yes, I will sing joyfully of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. You know, Jesus is our treasure. And whatever you are going through, whether it's joyous and peaceful, whether it's sorrowful, we are to lean into Jesus. He is here. He is with us. He is able. We're going to sing this song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in me. I invite you to sing to Jesus, who is our light and our strength.
Jesus, thank you that you are our only hope. And we do pray that you would help us to, to lean into you and to trust and to rest. In Jesus' name, amen.
Before I read our benediction, two quick reminders. Uh, first, if you'd like to register yourself uh, for VBS or your children for VBS or yourself to volunteer, you can let us know on the Connect card. Also, if you have, uh, y- yes, yeah, sorry guys, you can't be part of VBS. Uh, <laughs> you don't quite make the age cut off. Uh, also, if you'd like to learn more about baptism, please let us know on your Connect card. We can begin that conversation. Now, receive as your benediction the uh, ultimate contentment psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Happy Father's Day. Go in peace.